three, two, one. Welcome to the Light Forge. This is Adbukta. This is Murps. Happy New Year to all of you guys. Hope 2019 is going great for all of our listeners. Hope you're getting 12s in the arena. Let's start things off. Yeah, we're in 2019. Uh, the meta hasn't changed since the last patch, but the last patch came pretty close to the end of 2019. So we're going to we're gonna talk a little bit more uh, deeply about the last, last patch specifically. Uh, our last episode, we went over like 2018, a little bit 2017 even, and we look forward to 2019. But let's get back to the meta at hand. The meta that will probably change very soon whenever all the Blizzard people get back from their vacations and do a little more number crunching and give us some new buckets and a micro adjust. Um... So why don't we start things off with class balance, Murps? I know you made a you made a video on uh, on our YouTube channel, and uh, you guys can go can go check that out um, if you just go on our YouTube and look at our, our recently published videos. And it's like a fifteen minute um, explanation about like what's going on with Warrior right now because Warrior's been at the top of the meta for a long time, but this is this is very much not your your typical like meta dominant class, and we're not in a typical situation where one class is dominating the meta. And it's kind of been like this since uh, since Rastakhan's released, or even before that. Yeah, so obviously you can watch the 15-minute video. I'll try to keep this a little bit short. But the name of the video is Reframing the Warrior Problem. Because a lot of people have been complaining about warriors and saying, Super Quiet are this, Warpath that. And it seems a lot of people are annoyed at warriors in the arena. Um, and I want to put out a video to kind of talk about why um, this is a problem or why people complain because as of the video and right now it hasn't moved at all warrior is at a 53 percent win rate which as you know is very tame for a number one class right mm -hmm. we've seen a lot worse so the video explores kind of what makes warrior strong and then why do people complain so much and if you just want to skip to the point after I give a lot of explanations, it's mostly because Warrior is what I would consider a noob cannon class in which it is very easy to go into the draft, know what you're going to get, get that, and play it out. And one of the problems from a playstyle perspective is that if you want to beat Warriors, the, the majority of players, if they want to beat Warriors as another class, it typically takes... Mm -hmm. A lot higher skill set because if they want to beat warriors, which are control style, with control, a lot of times it comes down to who drafts better cards, right? Whose deck is better? Because you could just bomb while drafting. And, and who rolls well. higher cards? Like Dragon Warrior and um, Mech Assembly are the two main pieces of the warriors' uh, card advantage, and they're both heavy RNG. Like it is yeah. so easy to miss, and it is so easy to high roll. Um, it's it's very random. It's not like draw two cards from your deck, right? Like that's not anywhere near as random. Right. You could get Nightmare Amalgam or you could get Syndragosa or Ysera. Yeah. Huge differences there. Mm -hmm. So it, that's the control v control matchup. And if you want to look at mid range or aggro, we can definitely win that way as you and I have shown, but it takes a higher skill set. There's less margin for error. Right. And that is the entire point of the video in which after we've identified the fact that warriors are a noob cannon, and I even use examples from other games like Overwatch and Smash Ultimate to try to say this isn't just an arena problem, this isn't just a Hearthstone problem. It's this a, is a video problem that... game problem. Right. It's a it's a competitive video game. Like anytime you have any sort of PvP aspect, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there's always going to be problems in which not all characters are balanced in the same way, right? So. If you say that, oh, um, you have a junk rat and you can counter it with, look, I'm not Overwatch Pro, but you're, uh, if you say, oh, you know, just get like a good Tracer or just get a good Genji, well, these just are really get a top notch Widow, you'll be fine. Right, right. <laughs> or just, like, oh, get a really good Widow. You know, these are players or these are characters that, that require a lot higher skill. Um, so this is why in previous metas, before they nerfed Junkrat, we saw in Gold League, it was just like Junkrat versus Junkrat, right? And, yeah, then, and then it, it gets to into... Diamond. Like, I remember because I was in uh, Low Diamond at that time. It was just the absolute worst to get a Junkrat on your team. 
not because they're like <laughs> bad as Junkrat, but because Junkrat was bad. They're not lifting Junkrat to a new level. And by low diamond, everyone can counter Junkrat. You, you're good enough to like, you know, to figure it out. But in like silver, like, I don't know how you beat a Junkrat, <laughs> right? You don't have the communication and the tools to like really like do that. I can see why they're very OP. But then in the early parts of the game, once you hit a certain level of skill, it's not even a terribly high skill, right? It's just like, this is why we're saying, we're not saying like, uh, anyway, um, you just hit like a certain skill. Low diamond is not that hard to get into. Mid diamond is not that hard to get into. Um, but once you get there, like you don't want a junk rat on your team because that junk rat player can't do anything else because they've been maining junk rat and he plays so weird compared to other heroes. And he's just not effective at that level of play. And they've hit a wall and they're going to bring your team down with them. Sure. Yeah, so this is the problem that I outlined in the video, and I wanted to just create a discussion about this, see what people thought of it, and also to highlight, okay, here's what we should do, because this is a problem that um, I think people were, were focusing on Arena Warriors a little bit too much, and it really is just the same problem that we saw with Dragon Priest, that we saw with Firelands Portal Mage, these, quote, you know, what I would call noob cannon builds. And you can agree or disagree on how healthy they are. But if you think that this sort of thing is unhealthy, well, now Blizzard has a very complicated system with buttons and levers. And what buttons and levers should we push slash pull to make sure that this doesn't happen, right? Yeah, so, I mean, if you think they know how to pull their own buttons and levers... <laughs> Like, where have you been for the past year? Like, we're very congratulatory on Blizzard having done stuff and going in the right direction. But I have no faith that they know how to pull their levers and buttons on an archetype basis within a class, right? Or on a skill basis within a class at this point. We just want, like, they're having, tr not trouble, but they're, like, having their their next goal on the ladder of, like, you know, how to become a better, like, balanced game developer for the arena their next goal is to just like hit the button more frequently and have the button work a bit better. Not like create a new dimension within the button by figuring out what parts require more skill or less or like having some type of archetype balance. That's like, that's next level stuff that like they're not going to be doing for the arena like anytime soon. I agree that yeah. they have like tools and levers in that you won't need like a, a your programming team to do a ton of work to make this happen right you just need your balancing team to do the work but i don't know their balancing team is not doing that hasn't even attempted anything like that at this point yeah who knows look it's a new year it seems like the uh, team is trying to do things a little bit faster uh, listen to the community a little bit more so i'm open to further changes but if you guys do think Warriors are a problem and you guys are curious to know my thoughts and my thoughts for a solution as well, you can go check out the video. Okay. Um, so that that's on our YouTube at uh, YouTube slash Grid and Goat. Um, the, the Warriors right now have the HS Replay just came out with, uh, with the stats and they have finally broken to number one. Warriors now the number one, not just win rate. They've always been, they've been number one for a while now. Um, their win rate right now is actually like very close to Hunter. Hunter's 52.9%, Warrior's 53.1%. So they're not even like definitively number one. And their win rate's been going down because their usage rate has been going up. So more and more people who don't know how to play Warriors, more and more people who are like not as good at this game um, are, are picking up Warrior. And they're still finding a decent amount of success with it, but it's been dragging the stats down. Um, so yeah, uh, Warrior is now the most played class in the arena according to HS Replay. And, and that's that's pretty weird and terrible, uh, considering the state of the warrior right now. Um, and if you are in, like, like, the worst part is, it's not like these people are picking up warrior and, like, all just, like, easily getting five wins. They're not, because they don't know how to play warrior. I see so many warriors when I'm, like, 2-2 two -two for some reason. I'm like, oh, like, I'm, like, 1-1. One -one. It's like, oh, here's a warrior. I'm, like, 2-1. Oh, here's another warrior. I'm 2-2. Two -two. Oh, here's another warrior. And they all suck. Um, their decks are generally nothing to write home about because warriors whiff on drafts just like any other class even though they're a little more consistent with it um their drafts definitely went like took a step down after the patch uh because a lot of the control tools got bucketed up a bucket uh, but more than that the people just are, like are not playing them in a control way like you'll have people who like draft a bunch of twos and then don't do anything with it you have people who draft the normal control deck and then play it as if it's an aggro deck you'll have people who like just really think that hero powering every single turn is a must. Like, yeah, it's weird. I've seen, those. I've weird. seen all of those. And, and, 
like that's what's dragging Warrior down right now. It's it's really should be a little more consistent than that. But um, okay. Anyway, um, I, I think the the video that Murps uh, made and brings up it's a point that's like I, I don't think you're giving enough credit, uh, not credit enough. Well, I guess I don't think you're giving enough credit to the difficulty it is to change something like this um, in in something like the arena. Like I. Like, you, you think there's some kind of solution maybe somewhere. I think there's absolutely no chance for a solution that Blizzard is capable of implementing. I think if you were making a new game, or if you actually cared about the arena competitively, you would be able to do something like this. Um, but I think Blizzard is so far away from having an interest in doing so. Not like being successful with it or not, but from having an interest to do something to fix things at that level. Like, what Blizzard's going to do is just micro-adjust the whole class down. So Warriors will still be a noob cannon. It'll just be a much weaker noob cannon. And then a lot of noobs won't play the weaker noob cannon. And they'll go to, like, I don't know, another class that's, like, possibly also easy to play and has a slightly better micro-adjust to them than, than Warriors now. And that will, will kind of solve your problem and that Warriors won't be overpowered anymore, but there will still be a noob cannon. Like, if the cards, which are made with only constructed in mind is going to come out in a way that makes a particular class or a particular archetype in a class a noob cannon, as you, uh, as you describe it, then that class is going to stay a noob cannon. All Blizzard's going to do is tune the strength of the cannon, not well, the function of the cannon. I, I don't think, um, no matter what, there will always be a noob cannon, right? Remember well, but many minutes ago... What I'm saying ago, is, I, I don't think Blizzard can do any, or I don't think Blizzard will do anything to change that. It's based on the so amount either. of cards in the meta and the offering rates. Of which Blizzard is not going to specifically adjust to fix this problem. Like, the next expansion, yeah. right, with a rotation will probably just fix the problem by itself, right? Who knows? I do agree. I don't think much will be done. Um, and the video is not so much so... It, it wasn't made to convince Blizzard. It was more so like, hey, right. here's what I would do. Yeah. And, and the video is very good at describing the problem, right? Which I don't think that... Yeah. Like, the, uh, what I noticed, and I think you noticed it too, which is why you made the video, is... When this discussion pops up in the arena community, people aren't bringing this factor in at all. They're just talking about how strong Warrior is, right? How annoying it is to face Control Warrior. And that's only true to a certain extent, but it's masking what the actual problem with the Warrior is. That's special, right? Um, because otherwise, if you take another class, you put it at 53% win rate. And like, you know, back then, especially when people were complaining, like a 12% usage rate, you don't have a problem. This is right. like balance. That's why Blizzard's probably looking at it because they have all the numbers and they're like, all right, you know, way to overreact, guys. Like, you, it's a slightly off balance, like, whatever, right? Um, but that's not why it feels bad. Yeah. Um, and, and that really is, I, I mean, you nailed it. This is why I put out the video because 53% win rate is not that high mm -mm. and certainly should not correlate with all the the frustration that we've heard oh my so, god the frustrations the level has been higher than i even expected it like i know i get annoyed when i face this type of deck just in general like yeah it's slight shades of uh of priest back in the day with uh with potion of madness um except it's a little less random because you don't have to get anything on the early turns right you know you have the space with this warrior in the early turns, so you can get an aggro game like actually going but for a mid-range deck it's like similarly bad because the mid-range deck needs a little more space generally than the warrior is is going to give and so you have to you have to balance things a little bit more uh fine-tune um but yeah uh i mean the pro we'll, we'll see how much right like blizzard's gonna micro adjust blizzard's gonna rebuck it again and we'll see how much the warrior falls and we'll see after the warrior falls and is no longer number one whether we're still equally annoyed by the warrior right because it will remain a noob can in fact we'll, we'll see whether noobs still stay with the warrior they may ditch the warrior once it's no longer number one. There's a lot of bandwagoners right now on the warrior who don't necessarily like the warrior playstyle in here, but they just like recognize it as strong and easy. I think that's fair. Um, okay, so in class balance, at the top it's warrior, it's hunter, it's rogue, right? That's just, just make no mistake about it. Those three classes are better than other classes. Um, I would put warlock up there with them just because I've had so much success with warlock, and it's almost entirely dictated by warrior it, it, like 
once they nerf warrior, warlocks are going to be worse off as well. And that's just because of the offering rate and demon bolt. Like that one card gives the warlock such an edge in that warrior matchup. Um, and your ability to, uh, to get card advantage really, uh, uh, really is more impactful now than it used to be. So I think if you know what you're doing, warlocks are, are up there with rogue and hunter and warrior. Mages are a little less flexible, you know, in the, in the next step down. Uh, paladins are, I don't know, you seem to have something going on with the paladin that's working. I could not. Like last month I played a decent amount of paladin and it was just been mediocre all the way through. I just play faster mid range, right? Uh, I play my mid range is just your like, mid range uh, is like one or two cards faster than my mid range for paladin at most, if that, right? Like Ben, what I always have trouble with as paladin is getting damage on my opponent's face before I run out of like cards. I always have that problem when I'm playing paladin these days. I can set up well, I can control the board well, I can buff my stuff well, right? I have that big weapon as a finisher, but if I don't draw that big weapon on time, which is going to happen like half the time, right? Or like in your case, I'm looking at the deck that you're made. If you don't draw the the dino size on time, like what's what are you like how do you finish off this game? Like just if I don't draft pure tempo. Or... Yeah, pure tempo. If I don't draw my dino size, that means I probably drew my one drops, right? Right. That, it, 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 so, <laughs> like, that helps. But I do agree. It's not like Paladin is that strong. I wouldn't pick it over everything. Well, I mean, um, pa- wait, what, what, where would you rank Paladin right now? Um, so, for me, it's Rogue number one. Mm-hmm. Um, I think easily. Yeah, same here. Uh, yeah, I, I think they just have uh, the best consistency. For me, Hunter is number two um, because... It pains me to say this, but rogues just have too much consistency in um, how how well they can get through the early meta, like the, the early games in your run and the late games. Uh, and this is something that you actually have to watch out for as well. Maybe we should talk about this a little bit. Um, depending on how you draft, you it's very easy to go 12 wins or, or like zero to two wins now. Mm-hmm. Um, to, to, like with kind of a razor thin margin and i think we even saw this with some streamers as well i i know um or i don't know but i think you feel this way but for example yesterday hoffa went 12 12 0 12 and i looked at it i was like yeah this makes sense like today's meta is just something that will make this happen more often and we can talk about you know explain to people why but do you do you agree with this yeah, yeah. Like, uh, yeah. um and we'll yeah okay uh so it's it's more more variance than the game has i don't know that it has ever seen i feel like angoro saw even more um because angoro came with the rotation and it was like a big massive swingy kind of deal where you had a lot of power up front and you had a lot of power on the control side but at least when you look at witchwood and booms day they were much less swingy and it really has to do with, uh, with uh, the, I mean, okay, if you allow for a lot of archetypes to be successful, and then they meet each other, you're going to add more RNG. That's just a fact of life. Like, Blizzard can't out-design that even if they, like, try to do it and were, like, all-powerful, all-intelligent beings. It's not possible. That's just how games yeah. work. The more diversity you put in... The more things will soft counter other things, the more chances you meet a lot of soft counters in a row, right? Um, and that's part of what's happening. Another part of what's happening is that snowball effects are a little bigger in Rastakhan. And then we got an offering bonus, and so snowball effects are even bigger in Rastakhan post-patch. Um, it's not like the world's biggest difference, but it's all tilting in that like particular direction. Um, and you add uh, on top of all of that, the class, uh, the, the two most powerful classes, the two most commonly used powerful classes that, that people use right now are Warrior and Hunter. And they play the exact opposite style. Hunters people, push, Warriors yeah. just like hold and like armor up and defend. And so if you're a deck and you're able to beat Hunters, you probably can't beat Warriors. If you're a deck and you can beat Warriors, you're probably not going to beat Hunters. And you're going to meet up with a bunch of them. Like... When the, this goes kind of links up to the first point, but it really like specifically points out the very specific issue in this meta, which is that warriors and hunter are too polarized 
which is not a bad thing. That gives you a lot of options in diversity wise, right? Like if you're, I actually love this. Right? I I think this that this is a healthy quote unquote problem because I'm like finally it forces people to think about how mm-hmm. they play, right? It's not just like oh they like people keep on spamming rock. Okay, so I'm gonna play paper, right? Mm-hmm. It's like oh people keep on playing scissor. All right, it's rock time, babe. Like wow, or even worse, like rock is just better than paper and scissor. Let's just all play rock. <laughs> that was last year that was against terrible. Rock. That's, that's why true. last year i was just like this meta come on i was like slowing down so much <laughs> but now like we're, we're in a good meta i have fun when i play even if it's stressful and even if my win rates are like more like up and down than they used to be i love the fact that warriors and hunters are number one number two in win rate right now because you do have to thread this needle right mm-hmm. in terms of how you make your deck against the meta now it does mean that even when you try to thread the needle, sometimes you'll just miss, right? So Hafu's 03 deck was a hunter deck. And I look back at it, I was like, this is a perfectly fine mm-hmm. hunter deck. It was good. It's not aggro hunter, it was a mid-range hunter, which definitely works. It has the tools, but I'm like, yeah, I can definitely see how this bombs, right? Just because of how this meta is. Because she can get rushed at now. I don't know how she lost with that. I'm sure she played magnificently as she always mm-hmm. does judging by her other three 12 win runs um but she could just get rushed down by other uh other hunters other that hunters, draft faster right or if she faces warriors and she's not fast enough or she misses her drops mm-hmm. she just gets war path and dragon lord to death right and she just can't push enough damage i, I actually so, think right now mid-range hunter is in a pretty bad place post-patch like i think out of all the mid-range archetypes when every class is a mid-range option always right uh, yeah. but out of all the mid-range options hunter got hurt the most and we were like dr sign had a guide for this on arena hs pre-patch i played a lot of uh mid-range hunter pre-patch like i know how it works and then i played some after the patch the the speed and this will this will link it to game speed um, and we'll, we'll, I'll dig more into why this particular thing is no longer working as well. But I think it gets affected very heavily in here. And so, like, mid-range Hunter right now is more vulnerable than... I, it's definitely much more vulnerable than it was at the beginning of December. Um, it's probably more vulnerable than it's been in the last, like, six, six seven months. I would agree with that. Um, and just because I feel as though if you play... Mid-range, mid-range hunter can still win, mm-hmm. but if you play aggro hunter, you're much more in control of your own destiny. And I know that this is something in which people have tried and people have told me because I made the guide and one of the main complaints was Murps. I feel as though aggro hunter, you're just not in control of how the... No, uh, that's because how, no how one's actually goes. drafting aggro. Like, I really don't I believe know. that most of the people trying to draft aggro hunter are actually drafting an aggro hunter. I think they're drafting a faster mid-range hunter and calling it an aggro hunter and playing it like an aggro hunter and then not succeeding because the mid-range hunter is, like, a little bit worse. And then when you're playing it wrong because you think you're aggro, it's going to be even worse. I know. So this was actually... <laughs> this is actually going to be... a. Uh, um question from the goat no, for this let's week. do it let's do it Should question from the goat right now question from the goat all right question from the goat um and this comes from our subreddit uh by ajax v uh this was posted about a week ago um and it's a long post but essentially he says look i'm playing aggro hunter but i'm struggling against taunts right mm-hmm. um this he said he read Uh, Or he watched my guide and read Dr. Stein's guide. Uh, First of all, very smart. And he says, I find myself struggling against taunts, especially against warriors. Hello, Tarmord. Mm -hmm. In my best runs, I was offered some good removal at Hunter's Mark or Deadly Shot. And then he's essentially um, saying, like, I have these tools, but I still get destroyed by taunts. What is going on? Right. Um, All right. So. Number one, there will be games in which you just lose. I'm not saying there are no games like that. Some games, you just completely lose. You can face them 10 out of 10 times, you'll lose. But outside of those games, you are so much in control because of the consistency of your curve. And number one, uh, so there were a couple good responses. And um, one person said, well, I watched Murps's aggro run. And um, he was like, if you're going face too, too early, that is a problem because mm-hmm. I am very aggro in my draft and in my, 
you know, play style in terms of tempo, but I am very you're... careful with early board trades, mm -hmm. right? Very careful that's a, with that's that. That's the case with aggro hunters since classic. Sure. That's yeah, like a, it's... it's a way you play aggro hunter is to mm -hmm. not hit face until turn five, unless you have like a very safe opening. It's turn four for me. Okay, fine. Turn four. <laughs> turn four, turn right. five. But like, that feels really late because you're trying to end the game by turn seven, turn eight, right? But that, right. that's how it works. Um, because if you don't have any board presence, you're not going to get that 30 damage worth onto your opponent that you need. So here's the thing about snowballing. The earlier you start the snowball and the earlier you get the lead, um, the you'd be amazed at what a small incremental advantage you have on turn one going into turn two if played well, leads to a win by turn six versus a loss on turn nine for you, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and, and I think this is an aspect that people are getting wrong. So when they face that Tar Lord, in my mind, I'm already thinking, you did something wrong on turn two yeah. or turn three. Because you shouldn't get to the Tar Lord and be in trouble. So here's what you could possibly have done wrong, right? Number one, you used a removal a little bit too early. And then you might say, Murps, I've seen you Hunter's Mark to get one additional damage on turn five. And I'm like, yes, because I know that once I get this damage in, I win, mm -hmm. right? Unless get, they have the- The payoff is big enough and you have enough reason what your opponent can do, like- Exactly, right. But sometimes I'm like, all right, well, I have this uh, Hunter's Mark, but I can just- put down another minion, mm -hmm. trade my minion on the board, not get that face damage th this time. But when they do put down the Fury Set and when they do put down the Tarn Ward, I'm good. So there's a little bit of calculation there. And, and, and just, you know, the calculation is pretty much how much damage does this allow me to get on my opponent's face in this turn and the next turn. That's, and it's hard because that's, it's that's a that Hunter's Mark calculation of whether Hunter's Mark dealing one damage is good enough or I need to save it for like the Tarn Lord or whatever. Right, because it's not always what is on the board. And this is why Agro yeah. Hunter is tough. It is me saying there is an 80% chance I get 8 damage versus like, oh, I'm not sure. I could get 12 damage, but there is only like a 50-50 shot of this working, you know? Mm -hmm. So this is all the stuff that you have to be, these are the skills that you have to be thinking of. And this is why sometimes like that 80-90% chance of getting 8 damage, you know, setting up for that 8 damage is a lot better than me saying, oh, I could get 12 damage, but there's like a only a 40 or 50% chance of this working, right? So then you have to shift to the much safer damage because that is what you, like, that is what you are only able to tolerate in order to increase your win percentage. So I know that this didn't exactly answer. It's like, oh, what do you do for these taunts? But it really is focus on refining your early game because the more options you have the better snowball you have the more well equipped you are to deal with these taunts because if you're having problems with turn five turn six taunts i'm not saying that like oh you must have messed up but if you keep on finding yourself in this situation because i find myself in these situations as well right like if you keep on playing these out and compare it to my results we're going to be facing the same amount of taunts but what makes my hunter runs sort of like more successful it's because of the early snowballs because drafting better playing tighter in the uh early turns so focus on that focus on your early turns don't focus on your turn six leading into turn seven when they drop down the target yeah there's nothing focus to do at that point you, you lost or yeah. won at that point um here's a rule of thumb if you're playing a aggressive deck uh, if you are playing an aggressive deck and in the course of your game you have drawn like when you still have a board um, you have drawn one hard removal. You should win. Yeah. Now, especially if, if you only draw one, yeah, because that's the, that's the, the best. kind of the magic number. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, okay, if you draw three, you may actually be in a little bit of a trouble. Um, but that's why, like, what was saying, right? You don't take these hard removals. Um, yeah, exactly. So, yeah. So that's what you want to do. So if you're playing your game and you're like, oh, I'm just not drawing my hard removals because I only had one in my deck and I just don't draw it, like, most of the time fine you need another hard removal in your deck like tough luck that you the blizzard didn't give you like that hard removal right you're gonna be in a little bit of a trouble you're gonna lose certain matches that's just how the game works hard removal is very useful right now less useful for our aggro deck but it's overall very useful like you can't play mid-range without a ton of hard removal these days um so and, and that's why druid is literally the bottom like druid is number nine right now i don't even you know how much i love druid i don't even play druid anymore because the total lack of hard removal in druid destroys it for this meta 
Um, okay. Now, uh, on the other hand, if you're playing mid-range as a rule of thumb, um, if you draw two hard removals, you should win the game. Yes. And that means you should put in like three or maybe even four into your deck. Whereas for aggro, um, you should also put like three in your deck, but that's because your game is faster. So for mid range, you should put three to four. For aggro, you should put like, you can probably get away with two, but you probably want like three or like two and a half to whatever extent you can count a half a hard removal. Um, and I count Hunter's Mark in aggro deck as a hard removal. Uh, yeah, I, I want to address something as well um, because I see this question in the chat and I, I think it's fantastic. And, and I see people or hunters misplay against this a lot. Um, but someone in the chat asked, what about Tar Creeper, right? I, I think. You know, we talked about Tarn War in turn six, but people are like, wait, Tar Creeper is what really ends my run. It's like an overstatted three drop that taunts and I can't get past it. One of the things that I think people need to recognize, don't because people don't think about this enough, don't try to, you don't (laughs) need to get past it as soon as possible, right? That's one of the things. Recognize that when it goes back to them, it's not a three five. Mm -hmm. Like I think people focus on the fact that it's a three five, it's a one five one goes back to their turn. So you can actually even wait a turn or if if necessary, two, two turns, turns, which I have done done sometimes. Tar, even as a- Tar Creeper comes out on turn three. Remember when you have to deal damage to their face? Turn five. Right? Turn four. Okay. <laughs> Murps wants turn four, but really I want turn, turn four. five. Yeah. So if they Tar Creeper you and you're in a bad situation that you have terrible trades that you're going to do, don't do those trades. Wait until turn five. Then get your damage. You're fine. Yeah, because if it means trading off both, let's say your board is double three twos. If you're trading both of your three twos on turn three and then dropping a three four in, uh, you probably lost mm. because you probably coined out the three two, played a three two, and then they did nothing, played Tar Creeper, and you're just giving them the win right there. So what you should do in that scenario, drop your three four, keep both of your three twos. And then after you drop it, first of all, that 3-4 can go in advantageously, right? You've already gotten a better trade. Or maybe on the next turn, number one, you get a draw, right? That's when you draw your Hunter's Mark. Number two, maybe that's when it opens up to your multi-shot, opens up Grievous Bites, opens up to all these things. Like you delay for a turn, it's advantageous because you can draw something and it opens up better trades. So I've seen hunters on the other side when I drop Tar Creeper and I keep track of their hand. I'm just like, you could have played that better and you could have put me in a yep. tough spot. But you were afraid of this Tar Creeper. And in your mind, you say, I have enough to deal with it now. I have to deal with it eventually. Why not now? And that is great for a lot of things like homework and essay writing and whatever. <laughs> but you definitely delay advantageously in Hearthstone. <laughs> with certain classes, it's um, it's so easy to tell when they've misplayed. Like a hunter is one of them because it's, you're supposed to do certain things. Where like when I'm playing against a hunter, I know exactly whether they 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 did something right or wrong, and the percent times that they do something wrong is higher than any other class I face, like by a fair margin, and it's consistent historically. It's not like oh hunters are hard to play now. No, they've been equally hard or easy or whatever to play for like ever. Just people have never figured out how to play, or like the the percentage of people who know how to play them is, it just remains very low. Um, it, it is kind of counterintuitive. And you have to do the opposite of what you would do as any other class for a lot of the stuff. Um, but that doesn't seem to trip people up when they play like Warrior, right? Like They're like very comfortable being like, or okay, there's bad Warriors. Um, but a lot higher percentage of Warriors are more comfortable being like, oh, so this is how you play Priest now. Uh, and and yeah that's that's how you play priest now you well, play uh you play priest by selecting warrior and uh and then you pick the better cards right because warrior is at least similar to those other classes in which um they can erase mistakes right, right? hunter is very bad at erasing mistakes no you die um, if you make a mistake yeah um so even if they have very powerful cards it takes an astronomical amount of powerful cards mm-hmm. and an astronomical offering rate. Like we had uh, right after, I, I forgot when it was, but Hunters reached like 58% win rate um, at the, like about a year ago. Yeah. Right? More than, uh-huh. yeah. Uh-huh. Um, that was when Hunter was, was uh, no think Hunter. Spell stone, yeah, because they, pick, they pick just secrets, had... kit face. All the secrets, all the bows, all the flanking strikes. Yep. You had like triple flanking strike. Mm-hmm uh double it was terrible um, it was like yeah, very was much like all of a sudden they have like a whole entire board from nothing you have to like re-clear their board three times to like have a shot against them um but yeah yep 
Okay, so that's a question from the GOAT brought to you by our patrons. Patreon.com slash GrinningGOAT. Thank you so much, especially the, the new patrons uh, that we got over the new year. I'm um, looking forward to uh, to having you guys on board. Uh, and uh, yeah, um, patrons keep the lights on here at the Light Forge and, uh, and even more. So in case you're wondering, by the way, we just did like an audit of like our uh, website. We like lose like 500 bucks a year running the Light Forge website. Like, well, and also, you know, calculating stuff and all that, right? Um, but it's not like it's doing a calculation each time. So the ads are definitely not, like, um, are, are definitely not, like, covering it. So it's really helpful to have uh, to have uh, support, like, financially um, in, in, in all means um, to, to try to keep us in, in the black. Um, so, yeah. If you guys, you guys could white and whist oh, yeah. if you guys use it, that would Please. be real. Because our numbers are, like up or like down slightly or about the same right in terms of visitors but our ad revenue for whatever reason like died this past year um all right uh so uh back to this uh back to what we we're talking about with uh the classes once we got to the bottom Murps is like no i want to talk about hunter uh and we we went we went to the hunter um so we're talking about warlock warlock is good right now um with the hard removals really just because of the hard removals and also the card advantage uh thing um but yeah at the bottom you have kind of i guess paladin and priest are close enough I just have no idea how to play priest in this meta and I haven't tried yet. So that's one of the things I'm going to focus on in January is try to figure out priest and shaman uh, for for this meta as the meta changes. Um, and right after that is shaman, which we will play today. Um, ah, God, shaman. Just, I, I don't even like need to talk about like shaman and druid. Just don't play them. Like if you can afford to, just like, yeah, pick, pick another class. They're, they're so far below. Like whenever a class is 45% win rate, just don't touch them. Shaman and Druid have basically both had 45% win rate. Druid's technically a little yeah. lower. Just, they're, they're beyond saving um, at this point. Like, you, you take it as, like, a personal challenge. And they're going to get buffed. They're, like, certainly going to get buffed whenever Blizzard does their micro-adjust, which they had told us was going to be pretty early on in January. So I'm expecting it next week or early the week after that at, like, latest. Um, so yeah, so no, no need to do anything there. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's your Rastakhan class list. And, um, okay. So one thing I want to talk about for our deep fried meta, and this will really, 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 I think, and I feel like I talk about this maybe three times a year, whenever the meta really shifts and no one has any idea why, um, because nothing major has happened exactly. Like it wasn't like a bunch of new cards or like a particular really strong card warps the meta or anything like that. Um, and that's what happened. That's what happened in this patch. So you get an offering bonus to a bunch of Rastakhan cards. They're generally not the best cards, right? They're pretty good. They're not the best. They don't seem like they're changing the meta all that much. Um, you rebucket a couple things. There's no micro adjust that's even happened. And all of a sudden, like most of the things you were doing in Rastakhan work significantly less well. Like, it was crazy. My win rate dropped from 9.0 over the course of, like, almost 20 runs down to, like, 5.5 for, like, 10 runs. Like, I, okay, so there was, a o, there was a zero win run in there from 100 that had nothing to do with the meta. Um, but even without that, it was a, it was a very stark drop. And um, my playstyle is very sensitive to this kind of thing because I notice it a lot, and that's what I usually commentate on. And that's the macro. And the macro is when you play mid range, you focus on the macro a lot. You need to know exactly how you're positioned relative to your opponent at all times. You need to know the percentages of expectations of what they can reasonably do. And you need to know when you have to push, when you have to like hold back a little. And even before that, in the draft, you need to know what actually is a mid range draft. Like, if you don't know what a mid range draft is, you will draft like an aggro deck or a control deck and play it as mid range, and then you will die. And that's what I did. I started drafting aggressive decks for this meta, but not actually what I would consider an aggro deck. And I was playing them as a mid range deck, and they just did not last to the point that they need to. And I fixed it, but it took a few games before I, with a few different classes before I was like, really? Like, I did not believe how much of a difference this made, uh, this uh, adjustment of the patch made. Uh, but it did. And. What basically happens now is everybody has like a card and a half, a card to a card and a half more than they used to. Um, I can't tell you exactly why that's so, but the pace of the game has slowed down. And if you're playing a mid-range game, 
you're really focused on, um, and it's also why I don't get a lot of 12 O's because I have to make adjustments in the middle of my run. You're really focused on how the pacing of your run goes, which means if you're winning, you want to win with a pretty much empty hand or like one more turn left, right? So you have like one more card in your hand that you hope to play with the next card you draw. That's when you want to win. If you are winning with more cards in your hand, then you should be playing more aggressively or more slowly rather if you have more cards in your hand and if you are win um and if you are like losing with cards in your hand then you should be playing more aggressively that's it that's the very simple levers of how you should play your deck and i started losing a lot with no cards in my hand and so i was like okay so i'm running out of steam like a, a lot faster um i have to push more right because i don't have the cards necessary and I tried to push more, and I was like, no, I'm in a weird zone now. Now I'm pushing on, like, turn five, turn six. Now I'm in, like, the aggro zone of when I need to push. And I'm not an aggro deck. I know I'm not an aggro deck. I don't have the tools for an aggro deck. So what I've actually done is built a deck, consistently been building decks, with not enough card advantage for the meta. But it did have enough card advantage for the Rastakhan meta pre-patch. Which is where I wised up to the fact that, oh, you actually just, like, the meta's completely shifted. You, you need, like, one to two extra cards in your deck in order to be mid-range. So everything kind of, like, shifted backwards uh, to slow down a bit more. It's still not as slow as, uh, as Boomsday. But now, I just I started drafting in a way that was heavier um, and in a way that was less flexible. Because the heavier deck is less flexible. It is less choices you have. You don't want to be. You want to be as, like, light as possible for mid-range while still being mid-range. Um, and... It means that I have less options. Like, I'm not as aggressive when I need to be as aggressive. I'm not even as defensive when I need to be as defensive. Because defensive cards are like heals and stuff. And those are like generally low mana cards or like low impact on the board cards. It's not like a large card for like a lifesteal minion that costs like five, six mana. That's still a small card. Um, it just, it's worth a lot more because you're like stealing life. But it doesn't give you the card advantage. So instead, you need more card draws. You need, uh, you need larger cards if you can't get card draws. Uh, than you did before and so for anybody who the patch happened like two weeks ago and then your win rate like did something weird uh look into it if you're playing generally mid-range you want to be slowing down and i slowed down and all of a sudden my win rate was back up not to where it was before variants got more you know more heavy uh but it, it felt it felt more more like i was actually playing a mid-range deck rather than just randomly running out of steam w way too frequently um so yeah so if you want to know how to like get a feel within your mid-range deck just know your levers, right? If you're running out of cards, you need to go faster. At a certain point, if you're like, wait, why am I going this fast? Then you actually need to just build a deck to be slower. Um, and on the flip side, if you have too many cards when you're winning or losing, um, you need to be uh, like playing uh, a bit faster, but a bit like slower if you're losing or if you're already winning, then you know uh, push a bit slower. And it'll help your win rate on that side too, even if you are winning the game. Like, you'll win more later on for the future by doing that. Um, but if you find that your optimal amount that you need to push back to win the game with one card in your hand or zero cards in your hand is, like, larger than either the time in which you win the game or the time in which you lose the game, then that means you have too many cards in your deck and you should draft thinner. So those are the two ways that game speed impacts your draft and where mid-range actually is. Um... It's not the hardest thing in the world, but I don't think enough people really, like, internalize it. Like, they figure out what mid-range is in a particular meta, and they just draft that speed. And they're like, this is the speed of mid-range, which is great. But it's also very helpful to know how to adjust to a new speed, like, just by yourself. Because yeah. the faster you can adjust to that, then the faster you can pick up a new meta. Especially now when Blizzard's changing the meta every two weeks. Yep, I agree. Um, I've been finding a lot of success with aggro, right? And when you go aggro, you like you should go aggro. Um, at, and I've been going aggro with hunter, obviously, uh, but also rogue and paladin. Although these these are a little bit different. Paladin is more snowbally, right? And with paladin, I have to keep the board a lot longer than I do with hunter. With Rogue, it's about flipping faster. So with Rogue, a lot of the times my tempo at the end of my turn two compared with my tempo at the 
end of my turn two as Hunter is night and day, right? Uh, with Rogue, I'm aggressive, but sometimes I only have a one drop and a dagger, or sometimes even if I miss my one, just a dagger. But Rogue, with my saps and with my, um, you know, just other tools for tempo, I'm able to gain that back quickly, uh, which is a lot hard to do as Hunter. But no matter what, uh, you need to be drafting really tightly, right? You can't just be like, oh, yeah, but I'm okay with this one Stormwind Champion. And it's totally fine if you're going mid-range, but if you want to go aggro, you're like, okay, you know, I'm, I'm aggro enough. I'm just going to take this, like, one big thing, right? Um, no, you've kind of just started down the path of ruining your deck. So if you're aggro, just keep on going aggro. Take those cold bloods and uh, recognize how you win. So as Hunter, uh, early snowball, let go of your board a little sooner to go for face damage with Paladin. Same snowball in the be beginning. So how you play Paladin and Hunter at the beginning of the game is very similar. But on turn four, five, and six, you still aggressively hold onto your board as Paladin because you need that. While as Hunter, as early as turn four, you could just say, screw what happens with my board. I got this because I have reach and I have my uh, hero power. And with Rogue, you might not even have that much of a board on turn two. When it gets to turn four, five, and six, your board is looking pretty similar in terms of how much tempo you have as the Hunter and the Paladin, but you're not getting as much damage in the mid-turns, and then later on, you flip that switch, you sap their minion, and then you push for like 20 damage one turn, and that's how you win. So this is how you can play aggressively with all three of these classes if you guys want to go aggro. And... I second everything that Advocate just said in like, I don't know, 15 minutes or so. Okay, so game speed wise, if you're going aggro, it's it's very different mentality than, than if you're go if you're drafting for aggro than if you're drafting for mid-range. Because if you're drafting for mm -hmm. mid-range, you need to know where mid-range is. If you're drafting for aggro, you're you're drafting for the area in which this is the fastest you can go and consistently take games. Because you can just draft the fastest you can go, but you'll probably have trouble actually winning games um by by doing that because you're too thin so you're going the other way around right like um it, it, in mid-range you're trying to actually find the the perfect balance of being able to go forward and back and that's why mid-range um works a lot better if you have some defensive tools and some aggressive tools so you can burst that reach or burst that survivability depending on what you need and once you either like survive the push from an aggro class you win right and once you like, if you're facing a slightly more controlled class, you want to be able to have the options to just like go face and like much faster than you would otherwise. Um, so these are tools that work better if they also work on tempo. So like something like a, uh, a heal, like a flex heal, heal on board or heal on face is uh, is really good. Or something like a life steal minion is even okay um, for for the healing part of it and for the aggressive part of it. Something like buff a creature on the board or like a fireball. Uh, that can hit the board or the face are all like they give you the options right that's what mid-range lives on but if you're aggressive you don't need like you don't really care where mid-range is if you're aggro because if mid-range is on turn let's just call by turn it's not, it doesn't really have anything to do with the turn but let's say if mid-range is a nine and you're an aggro and you can win with a deck that goes three then you would draft a deck that goes three Mid-range could be 7 or 8 or 9 or 10 or 12. You don't care. All you care about is at which point your deck just, like, can't even finish the job and deal 30 damage to the opponent's face. That's when you go too fast. After that, you don't go any slower. Like, going slower is actually worse for you. Because, generally, the deck that is slightly slower than the other deck wins. So, if you're aggro, that's not what you're aiming for. Um, so if you're doing this uh, thing with the deep fried metal that we're talking about, which is drafting for game speed, um, your your measurement is not the same at all as as your mid range decks in terms of how you're measuring like the amount of stuff you stick in the, into the deck. Um, and same with control. Uh, with, with control, you're trying to go as slow as absolutely possible while not dying, like or like not dying too frequently. Um, but yeah, but mid range is the one that adjusts based on what other people are doing. Uh, control adjusts somewhat based on what other people are doing only because you have to survive uh, but aggro doesn't really care what other people are doing that's like the meta shifts on aggro based on how much you can get 30 damage on your opponent's face not not really a lot of a lot of other stuff so 
it is uh it, it shifts more on what cards get added to the meta than how people's choices are affecting the meta anyway uh that's the deep fried meta let's um let's move on to card good bad you know i i think we've spent too much time maybe we push it back one more week <laughs> Car good bad from like three weeks ago is Arena Fanatic. And um before they nerf Warriors, let's talk about Arena Fanatic, which is really the best card for Warrior compared to any other class. Um Arena Fanatic, we rate a 104. It is in which bucket is Arena Fanatic in? It's in a decently high bucket. So this is a new yeah. a new Rastakon card. It's in uh the top of the fifth bucket right now. Um which you know, means that it's on the lower end of uh, of the top of the fifth bucket um, for our score, right? Because the fifth bucket averages out to like 115 or something for us. So like a 105, on 104 is pretty bad. Um, you're not going to take it a lot if you listen to our tier list. But I'm sure if you play a lot of the arena, like me, uh, you get destroyed by Arena Fanatic now and then. Like the Arena Fanatic, you're like, oh, crap. And then, like, three turns later, you're like, well, yeah, I pretty much lost because of that Arena Fanatic and the cards that they happen to have in their hand. Um, so, it's a good time, I think, to, like, kind of discuss Arena Fanatic now. All right. Yeah. Anyways, I will go first. Arena Fanatic is one of the reasons. Okay, uh, I'll, let's, just, see- let's say, let, let me first say what Arena Fanatic actually is. I realize we, we oh, didn't do that. It's a 4-mana 2-3 card that has a battle cry. Give all minions in your hand plus 1 plus 1. Yes. Okay. I'm going to uh, say Arena Fanatic is one of the reasons why I do not play Control these days. Because... I feel, and I know people feel differently. The vast majority of people feel differently, but they're wrong, okay? Your feelings are wrong. Your feelings are a lie. People feel when they play control, when they draft control warrior or when they draft control priest, that they have more control over their own destiny on what happens. They're like, oh, if I draft control, I am more, I have more consistency. I'm more assured of eight nine wins than aggro in which like look at this small sample size i only play five turns they could just drop tar creeper and my run is ended herpa derp um that is a complete lie and it's be- partly because of cards like arena fanatic now we talked about dragon's roar and how like kind of rng that is but when you are necessarily pulling back and your opponent is pulling back in a control v control matchup what happens is your opponent can just drop something like Arena Fanatic, and suddenly, you know, you were hoping that they would just drop the Yeti, right? Because the Yeti is easily taken care of. But what you don't want is them buffing their entire huge hand, and now your hand is smaller in comparison. So the difference between the 4 5 and the 2 3 in the control versus control matchup is like nothing, because you guys are, aren't, like, no one's dying anytime soon, right? But once the turn drags on, that plus one, plus one in your opponent's entire hand makes a huge difference so whenever i played like that slow control style first of all i find it boring as hell but whenever i'm just like okay you know both of us are just gonna like try to use our cars i'm gonna make better decisions but even if i make better decisions it's number one hard for me to outvalue their dragon boars if they roll well and number two it's hard for me to make better decisions than plus one plus one to their entire hand right that is also tough so that is like Arena Fanatic is one of the many, many reasons that I'm just like contr- playing control and then facing someone else who has a control deck. I'm just like, no, I don't feel like I have that consistency as I do with playing a tight mid range deck with all of my options or an aggro in which I can contr- control my early destiny, like my own destiny, because I control my curve right i control so, sort of so that i'm and gonna I put a huge asterisk on what you just said because that okay. only applies when you're facing control yeah no oh, definitely definitely this is why i keep saying in the control versus yeah. control yeah exactly yeah. and you said it but i don't i think you're not emphasizing that enough because if control is one third of the meta aggro is one third of the meta mid-range is one third of the meta then control is safer for one third right is more uh more consistent right against mid-range control is less consistent against 
um, against control and less consistent against aggro. So overall, it's minus 33% um, on the, which is not good, right? Now, on the other hand, if you look at aggro and aggro is against one third aggro, that's not, you're not really in control of that. That's very RNG. Um, against control, you are very much in control of that. And against mid range, you're not really in control of that. So you're also minus 33%. Um, Mid-range is the only one that comes out on this analysis, like, on top. And that's why mid-range is usually where, like, you're defaulting to. It's usually where uh, the place with, like, the most impactful, like, decision to number of decision, whatever ratio, like, overall. It's the most sensitive, right? Um, like, it doesn't have the power of either control or aggro, but it puts a lot more stuff into your hands. It's also why, you know, even back in the day, everyone's like, ah, draft mid-range. Like, good players can get, like, seven wins off a really bad mid-range deck, right? Why? Yeah. Well, you have the... Eventually, the decks are going to make sure that you can't do anything with mid-range, right? Like, past a certain point, no decision I'm going to make is going to win with my deck compared to another deck that's just better. Like, way better. But against a certain level of players, you can do that with a mid-range deck. So... When you're looking at control, the I think the what you're pointing out is that the the misconception is that control is safer. Control is yeah. no safer than aggro. It's not less safe than aggro in a balanced meta. Our problem right now, though, like from your perspective, I think it's true, is that there's more control decks in the meta than aggro decks. Yeah. And so that makes control less stable. That makes control mm -hmm. less in your control. And aggro more in your control. It's in the name, though. Control. You're in such control of everything. It's only called uh, control, yeah. by the way, because of MTG. It is. And in MTG, yeah. you can act on your opponent's turn. So you actually are in control playing a control deck. In Hearthstone, control is called... Re it should really be named reactionary. Where yeah. you're not controlling anything. You have to react to your opponent putting stuff on the board. Um... And so it, it takes on a different tone. Like this is we're just using MTG lingo because it's what's stuck. Um, but in attacker chooses games, it's it's very different. Um, but okay, so yeah, Arena Fanatic is one of the ways, and it does. I see Arena Fanatics everywhere in, right? uh, when yeah. facing control decks, and it's because it's good if you're if you have a large hand. If you're expecting to have a large hand, I think if you can have three minions in your hand on average when you play an Arena Fanatic, you're doing okay with the Arena Fanatic. You're like hitting like the the value. Um, does that mean you should pick it? No, it's still a little over-bucketed. You should not be picking this card if you expect to have, like, let's say, four cards in your hand when you play the Arena Fanatic. Um, you want more than four cards in your hand, because one of those cards is probably a weapon or a spell. Um, but if you're a control warrior, you're going to have more than four cards in your hand when you play the Arena Fanatic. It's probably not going to come out on turn four unless you've already Dragon Roared on turn two. But whenever it comes out... Um, you're you're going to get value off of it, especially later on. Like a very nice play later on is you arena fanatic and you play like one or two other cards that are creatures, uh, and all of a sudden you've gotten all the tempo from arena fanatic on that turn, and the rest of your hand is still buffed. It's just pure bonus. Um, so arena fanatic, like it may seem like one of those like oh we'll anti tempo a little bit and then we'll get the tempo back later, but no later on in the game. It's oftentimes like we don't lose any tempo right now, and we'll just get more tempo later as well. Like, yep, that's the that's the win on Arena Fanatic. And what kinds of decks put you in that situation the most? Warriors, because all of your card draw cards don't even just draw cards; they specifically give you minions. Like, you can't miss with these cards in, in, in the sense of getting a, a spell or a weapon that you can't then buff with uh, with Arena Fanatic. Uh, so yeah, so that's uh, that's our card good bad. Um, let's uh, let's figure out a, a card good bad for for next week. We've talked about um, a lot of a lot of I think interesting uh, interesting cards, but let's let's do one last. Well, you know, maybe more, one one more of the. What is arena? Is arena fanatic rare? Arena fanatic is common. Let's do one more common neutral before we shift to the class cards. Um, for next week, let's do Sightless Ranger. Oh, okay. This okay. is I like uh, that. the yeah. five mana three four rush overkill summon two one one bats. It is neutral. It is again. We think it's a little like 
over bucketed but it's definitely a pickable card and you see it enough in the arena so how do you deal with it how do you play it when do you draft it um yeah uh i mean we're not changing our our tier scores for these cards or anything like arena fanatic good or bad depends on your deck right that's why it has a a very middling kind of score but generally bad like i would say like it's over bucketed right now to the point that you need a control deck a certain type of control like not even just any control deck for arena fanatic to really get its value um but it is also a good way to increase the size of your control deck without needing to draw cards because you can you maybe only offer so many card draw cards right like you need some ways yeah. to get size and this is a way to do something on turn four um and still get the size all righty that's it i thought this was good i thought we did a lot of meta analysis this was a deep fried meta worthy of a deep fried meta mm -hmm. um and it's all all one, on uh, basically one hour uh Okay, so we'll see you guys uh, next week on the Lightforge for more meta analysis, maybe even a micro adjust analysis if they come out with the patch in in quick in quick fashion. But uh, but if not, we can go deeper into this. This is um, this is a a very interesting meta right now, and you know we think it's a step back in terms of how skillful it is compared to the pre patch meta but but still still doing pretty well um in the whole like picture of you know arena metas that we've seen uh and maybe this next patch will will really like push it back to where it was before or maybe not really a, a lot of the problem is the offering rate uh bonus to rastakhan cards that everybody wanted including us but we all knew that it was going to make the meta a little bit less skillful um in exchange for fun right all right all right that's it for this week. We'll see you guys next week. Until then, this is Adwikta. This is Murps. See you guys.